I had the privilege of working in the South for a few years, and a question that I used to get all the time was simply, what's your church? And for a while, I'd simply answer, oh, the Roman Catholic Church, I'm, I'm a member of the Roman Catholic Church. But I realized pretty soon that what they were asking was what parish I worked at. And it just reminded me in preparing this video that we can mean so many things when we say church. You know, with a lowercase c, it can mean a parish, it can mean another place of worship, like a shrine or a chapel. Uh, with a big C, capital C, we could be thinking about the church, you know, we call the hierarchy, like the pope, the bishops, and the priests, and things like that. In, uh, in church documents, it can refer really to the church spread throughout the world, or it can refer to specific dioceses like Rome, or Bombay, or New York. And it can also refer to other Christian denominations like the Russian Orthodox Church or the, the Lutheran Church. But the question we want to answer today is a little different. Because we can point to any one of these things and we know that it doesn't completely explain what the church is. This is not a question that we can be indifferent to. If we're members of the church, we should know what we're a part of. And if we want others to learn about and become part of the church, well, we need to at least help them understand it better. We need to be able to explain it. And fortunately, we don't have to work in a vacuum. Because when uh, bishops gathered from around the world in 1962 for the Second Vatican Council, the main question they asked uh, in the recollections of Carol Wojtyla, who was then later Pope John Paul II, was the question they were asking was, Church, what do you have to say about yourself? In the year 2000, then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who's now Pope Benedict XVI, when he was rec recollecting about that, he had attended the council as an expert. And he said, not only in Germany, but throughout the Catholic Church, it was felt that the theme of the council should be the church. So the dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, was approved on November 21st, 1964, after about two years of discussion on the topic amongst other topics in the council. So, as a member of the church, Lumen Gentium can help you answer the same question. You, as a member of the church, what is the church to you? What is your church? It's a question that's just as relevant today as it was in 1962. So, for the next few minutes, we're going to go through each chapter of Lumen Gentium and present some of their basic ideas in order to better understand the church and the role that each of us have to play in her, in, in her mission. So we'll begin with chapter one. Chapter one is entitled, The Mystery of the Church. Now, when this chapter speaks of the mystery of the church, it's trying to help us understand what the church is. The church is part of our Heavenly Father's plan. Our Heavenly Father planned from the beginning, from all eternity, to raise men to a participation in divine life, which was a holiness in communion with Him. He had that plan from the beginning and that holiness and communion that would one day blossom into eternal happiness. Now, the church is considered Christ's kingdom, as the document describes it, quote, now present in mystery. What does that mean? Well, to carry out our Father's plan, as the document, as Lumen Gentium tells us, quote, Christ inaugurated the kingdom of heaven on earth and revealed to us the mystery of that kingdom. So the church is that kingdom. It's the kingdom of Christ now present in mystery. Now, a little warning here. Mystery here is not referring to detective work or crime stories, but something characteristic of the wisdom of God. St. Paul describes it in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, quote, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. So, God's plan has been inaugurated by Christ on earth and now continues through his church. And that's the mystery of the church. That brings us to chapter 2. Chapter 2 is entitled, The People of God. And it's important to understand the concept of the people of God because it reminds us that God didn't want to just save us individually one by one. He wanted to bring us together. Everyone in the church is part of the people of God. So what are some of the characteristics of this people? Well, first, we are a priestly people. By baptism, we become part of what's called the common priesthood of the faithful. Some members of the church also, through the sacrament of holy orders, 
become hierarchical or ministerial priests, and they're at the service of the church. So they help the common priests of the faithful to be fruitful as well. Second, the people of God are witnesses to Christ, and they're helped by the Holy Spirit to do that. Because as witnesses to Christ, the people of God are helped to not deviate in matters of faith and matters of morals. And the Holy Spirit helps them to preach the gospel as well. And that goes from the top, from the way to the, from the Pope, all the way down to somebody just sharing the faith with their friends and their family, their, the people that they work with. The people of God are a Catholic and universal people. Now, since the citizens of this kingdom, you know, the kingdom of Christ, now present in mystery, come from every race, this kingdom is a heavenly one. It's not an earthly one. And that means that throughout the world, the people of God are in communion with each other in the Holy Spirit. But they also contribute something to their earthly kingdoms as well. They purify them, they strengthen them, and they elevate and ennoble them. So they have something to contribute to each society and culture that they live in, even though they're all united in this heavenly kingdom in communion with the Holy Spirit. We come to chapter 3. Chapter 3 uh, entitled on the hierarchical structure of the church and in particular on the episcopate. So after considering the people of God as a whole, the following chapters of the document, most of them, concentrate on specific groups within the whole, beginning with what we call the hierarchy, sacred ministers. Okay, sacred ministers referring to bishops, priests, and deacons. Ministers with a sacred power serve the brethren to help all arrive at salvation through working toward a common goal freely and in an orderly way. Now, this ministry has existed from beginning. We can talk about the ministry of the Twelve, of the Twelve Apostles. Because Jesus formed the Apostles as a stable group, He placed Peter in charge of them, and He sent them to the children of Israel and to all the nations to make all peoples His disciples, and thus spread the church. But needless to say, with such a big mission, this ministry extended beyond the lifetime of the Apostles. And so that's why they had a need for this, their successors. And those successors are the bishops. That ministry, the ministry of the bishops, continues and extends beyond the lifetime of the apostles. Now, the bishops are helped by a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the apostles received on the day of Pentecost. And it's handed on through the sacrament of holy orders. So their succession, the succession of bishops, is called going back to the apostolic succession. It goes back to the beginning. And they pass on the apostolic seed, and through them, the apostolic tradition with the apostles' hand on is manifested and preserved. Now, today, the Pope as Peter's successor and the bishops as successors of the apostles, in, in, the apostles in communion with him, they form one stable group or college. So bishops work not only for their whole flock, but with each other and with the Pope for the good of the whole church. And then in the end, the other sacred ministers, the bishops are also helped by priests and deacons. So when we use the term clergy, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the term clergy as kind of a category of belonging to the church, we're talking about bishops, priests, and deacons. And the priests and deacons actually help the bishop. That brings us to chapter four, the laity. Now, the laity have a very important role in the church's mission. The laity contribute to the welfare of the entire church because if there's kind of three categories we can consider, we already considered the clergy. Now we're going to talk about the laity. And another category we're going to talk about are religious. All have a unique part in the mystical body of Christ, and they have a role to play for the good of the whole body. So what's the role of laity? What do they have specific to contribute to the church and the world? Well, the laity are a sort of leaven for the world. If there's something that's characteristic of the laity, it's their secular nature. But not in a bad sense of that word, like secularization understood in the bad sense of the word. They're secular in that they can boldly go where no clergy or religious has or often has gone before. The lady can go to their workplaces, they can go to their family, they can go to their social circles, they can go to anywhere where they arrange their kind of temporal affairs, places that clergy and religious simply don't go, and they can give witness to the gospel there. Chapter 5 takes a pause from going into the categories of the church, and with chapter 5, we come to what's called the universal call to holiness in the church. And the main goal of this chapter is to break a little bit of a misconception. Everyone in the church is called to holiness not just clergy and religious. It's not just for sister, it's not just for father, it's not just for his excellency. Everyone is called to holiness. 
Even though everyone's called to holiness, the path to holiness varies. But charity is kind of the fundament, the basics of everyone's path to holiness. Because it's the way, all the ways and means for holiness, depending on what you're called to do, kind of have their foundation. So this chapter lists typical ways of holiness, suggestions for holiness for clergy, holiness for religious, and holiness for laity as well, so that everybody can see how to grow in holiness according to their own calling and condition of life. And that brings us to chapter 6. Chapter 6 is about religious, okay? And when we talk about religious, it's not simply referring to religious people, okay? Religious are people who come from both the clergy and the laity. Because clergy, religious, and laity, the three categories we've talked about until now, they're not mutually exclusive states. Because religious can actually come from both the clerical and the lay state of life. God calls from each of these states of life. Being religious is based on three evangelical counsels that are fundamental. On poverty, on chastity, and obedience. And these evangelical counsels, so to speak, are kind of gospel advice because they're based on the Lord's words and example. We can see the foundations of them in Scripture. But just following the evangelical counsels does not make you a religious. It requires binding yourself to those counsels through what are called vows, or something equivalent to vows, as Lumen Gentium describes, like vows in their purpose. Through doing this, a person dedicates themselves to God loved above all things. That brings us to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church and its union with the church in heaven. Okay, that's a big mouthful, so let's try and unpack that. The church is only going to achieve her full perfection in the glory of heaven when all things are restored. The human race, as well as the entire world, are reestablished in Christ. Okay, so we're talking about the end of time. We're talking about the second coming. But even now, Christ, risen and ascended to the right hand of the Father, continues to be active in the world to lead men to the church. And this is a process that's happening even now. Because the church already on earth bears the signs of a real but imperfect sanctity. Okay, holiness is happen happening. It's in heaven when holiness is going to achieve its completeness. But right now, we have a holiness that the document describes as real but imperfect, in the sense that that holiness is not complete yet. So we work toward the day when we appear with Christ in glory, when that holiness achieves its perfection. Christians, until that time, until Christ's return, are in one of three basic states. They're either down here on earth like us, they're in purgatory, being purified of their sins, or they're in heaven already, gazing upon our Lord, gazing upon God face to face. But even though they're in those three states, they share in one communion. They strengthen each other with their spiritual goods. We as souls on earth, we can pray for the souls in purgatory to help them get their purification done more quickly and to help them get to heaven. And in turn, the saints in heaven can pray and intercede for us in order to help us to persevere and to grow in holiness. Chapter 8, The Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God in the Mystery of Christ and the Church. First, why does Mary deserve our reverence in the first place? Second, it helps us to understand that Mary has a saving influence, but we can't fall into a mistake of thinking that that saving influence is somehow above or independent of her son. It flows from her son. It flows from Jesus, from the work of salvation that he's done for us. And there's also a little warning in this chapter, okay? Because it uses the term about the cult due to Mary. All right, when we're talking about cult here, we're not talking about cults, okay? We're not talking about creepy guys running around doing strange rites in black robes. Cult doesn't mean worship here whenever it's being used, because here it's not a good translation from the Latin original word, okay? The Latin original is cultus. So here, when it refers to Mary, it's one of the meanings of that word cultus, which is devotion to Mary, not worship. When you use cult and you're talking about God, you're talking about worship. But when you're talking about Mary or one of the saints, you're talking about veneration or devotion. So in conclusion, I entrust your study and meditation to Lumen Gentium to our Blessed Mother. And I pray that through prayer and meditation on understanding what the church is and your role in it, that you'll be able to really take advantage of this year of faith 
to love and spread uh, your knowledge and love of the church even more and to help others to grow in their faith. God bless you.